Our next speaker is Dr. Matthew Riley. He comes to us from Yale and happened to be in town, which is our great good fortune. Dr. Matthew Riley is a lecturer in Christianity and Ecology at Yale Divinity School and the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where he teaches courses on religion and ecology, animal ethics, and environmental ethics. He is also engaged in building an online course in religion and ecology at Yale and works as a research associate for the Forum on Religion and Ecology. And he has many, many other accomplishments, but I think we should just hear from Matt. Please welcome Matt. Thank you for skipping over some of that. It's always embarrassing. <laughs> They're great, but I want to hear you talk. I don't know why it's not going to close the screen. I think it's fine with that. Yeah. How fitting it is to be invited to speak here in San Francisco uh, about a figure named Lynn Townsend White Jr. Lynn White was born here in San Francisco and he grew up here and he spent 15 years as president of Mills College uh, just a few miles away down in Oakland. Am I pointing the right way here? By the way, is that Oakland? This way? Oakland. So I'm from Connecticut, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, it was also near here, uh, in the woods near San Francisco, where White experienced one of his most memorable moments of environmental outrage, where he found cigarette butts littered around the base of redwood trees, um, a moment that would, would shape him deeply. There was also St. Francis, uh, the figure this town is named after, who inspired White to write the article that Dave mentioned earlier, the, the 1967 article, The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis. Historical roots, as many of us are well aware, <clears throat> has been a source of continuous debate and controversy in the field of religion and ecology. In the 50 years since its original publication, <coughs> hundreds, perhaps even thousands, of books and articles have been written as a direct response to it. And whether those of you in this room have read Lynn White's article or not, you've by now uh, more than likely absorbed his now infamous thesis uh, that Christianity bears a huge burden of guilt for the environmental crisis. And also the converse of that, that uh, religion also has to be rethought if we're going to address environmental problems. So religion can also be part of the solution as well. The field of ecotheology, especially in its earliest stages, has largely shaped itself in response to these accusations made by White, particularly his critique of biblical dominion and uh, Christian anthropocentrism. Thanks in a large part to White's critique, the language and attitudes of stewardship have, been, have experienced a tremendous surge in popularity in contemporary Christian theology and in Christian churches. But today in response, I wish to propose a different interpretation of Lynn White's work. In the past 15 years, Christian theologians and Christian activists have rallied in response to White's critique of dominion and have articulated messages of creation care, messages of stewardship, and uh, have transformed the Christian landscapes of, the, of the Christian environmentalism. Um, entire forests worth of paper have been transformed into responses, uh, responses to Lynn White. His, his article has been read before Congress. It's been reprinted in the Boy Scout Handbook. It's been translated into Japanese, French, German, and Spanish. It's been republished ad nauseum in, in edited volumes on environmental ethics. Historical roots is in the, the very environmental air we breathe, so to speak. Most of us are sick of hearing about it, um, but we can't escape it, right? Um, many of us who teach courses on religion and ecology force our students to read it on the very first day of class, right? It's, it's the standard of our field. 
Um, yet despite this fact, the historical roots is one of the most widely read articles and most widely cited articles in our field of study. It's a text that's more often referenced than actually read or studied in depth. Um, Lynn White is a straw man that we set up to knock down again and again. Uh, so in response to this, today I'm going to go through some of White's lesser known texts and some of his unpublished archival materials to speak with you about some of the constructive theological aspects of White's thought that have been largely overlooked in the past five decades. So perhaps the, the best way to talk about White's own uh, theology of ecology, as he calls it, is to let White speak for himself. So six years after publishing his now infamous thesis, White wrote an article called Continuing the Conversation. And in that text, he expanded upon his argument from historical roots and answered some of the complaints of his critics. And uh, here, to underscore the development of White's own theological thought, I'd like to share with you the same anecdote that White started that paper with. So long before he had heard the word ecology, and before he had written his famous essay, White traveled to Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. It was 1926, and as White tells it, uh, British colonial officials had given the order for roads to be cut through the dense green jungles of, of Ceylon, connecting the tea plantations in the island's interior with the British-controlled seaside ports to expedite the shipping of tea. And White was fascinated, he was intrigued by the sight of workers clearing these paths through the red clay of the forest, the contrast between the red soil and the green, uh, green jungle all around him. Uh, and in the midst of these developing roadways, he observed that there were numerous cones of earth, two or three feet high, in, in the midst of these otherwise level paths. And he inquired what these cones of earth were and why they were left in this otherwise level road. And he was told that they were spared not because, oh, I'm sorry, I, I think I skipped a part here. He was told that they were snakes' nests and the workers had left them out of respect for the animals who lived there, right? And then he was told that many of the, uh, excuse me, I lost my place, that these snakes nests were spared not because the workmen were afraid of snakes, but because of a feeling by the workers that the snake had a right to its house so long as it wanted to stay there. This was due, at least partially imagined, by the fact that the local laborers were Buddhists and that this invited them to see these animals much more differently than he was accustomed to. And in his words, many of the officials seemed to be Scots. And it occurred to me that if the men with the shovels in their hands had likewise been Presbyterians, the snakes would have fared less well. <laughs> so this chance encounter of snakes, White, White goes on to admit, was the seed from which his own quote unquote personal theology of ecology grew. Um, but what is his personal theology of ecology? For starters, it's very clear that White did not endorse a stewardship position, which has become sort of the legacy of Lynn White's historical roots. So just two months after publishing that text in 1967, um, in the spring of 1967, two months later, he published a little uh, blurb in the journal Science where he was responding to some of his already vocal critics. And uh, he was also receiving death threats at this time as well. And he expressed dismay at his fellow Christians' sudden interest in biblical stewardship, where he suggested that stewardship was nothing short of, quote, enlightened despotism of man over the rest of nature. Right? So all too often, White's respondents have picked this low-hanging fruit of dominion ideology and have attempted to explain it away with stewardship thinking and creation care. And, and White says that these are undeniably important tasks to make this step, but in his assessment, stewardship is at best insufficient and at worst dangerous to humans, to the environment, and to the human spirit. So in 1978, White explained his critique of stewardship in further detail, and I quote, 15 years ago, Almost no theologian knew what the word ecology meant. Having discovered it and the dire problems implied in it, religious thinkers have been precipitously abandoning the doctrine of man's dominion over nature for that of man's stewardship of nature. Stewardship will only deepen the disaster. 
Mankind cannot be trusted to be stewards with us of nature. When we must decide whether to benefit the lilies or sparrows or ourselves, we will recall that, the, that while our Heavenly Father is mindful of both lilies and sparrows, he cares even more deeply for us. So, in obedience to the divine preference, we shall opt for us. This criticism of stewardship is tied in with White's concern over Christianity's erasure of the spiritual autonomy of creatures and the rise of anthropocentrism in mainstream medieval Christian theology. As many of us are aware, White, White identified what he called the eradication of pagan animism from the medieval uh, Western European medieval landscape as a, as a turning point, a spiritual turning point in medieval history. So significant was this sea change in worldviews that White deemed this flooding of Europe with anti-animistic sentiments the, quote, greatest psycho psychic revolution in the history of our culture. He bemoaned what he called the indifference to the possibility of autonomy <coughs> and other creatures in, contemporary, in the contemporary Christian tradition and the disastrous effects this had for creatures, for the environment, and for humans. So in answer to this monumental shift in worldviews, White suggested that the religious answer to the environmental crisis needs to, above all else, um, recover religious attitudes akin to animism. So he's suggesting a Christian animism. And he expands upon this in, in a visit to the World Council of Churches uh, headquarters in Geneva in 1972, where he uh, published an interview that he, that he was part of called Snake Nests and Icons, some observations on theology and ecology. And in this conversation, White emphasized the imperative that contemporary Christians find a, quote, viable, modern, Christian equivalent of animism. I'm searching, he stated, for ways to regain the perception of the spirituality of all creatures and to, to demote modern man from absolute monarchy over nature. So by recovering the appreciation for the spirituality of all creatures, in other words, White believed that Christian ethics was capable of transcending its anthropocentric tendencies, and he thought this was achievable through theological means, Christian theological means. And White himself was, was no stranger to, to theological reflection. He studied theology at uh, Union Theological Seminary with Reinhold Niebuhr, and he discussed theology daily, or almost daily, with his father, who was a prominent Presbyterian minister at the First Presbyterian Church in San Rafael, which is just north of here. Is that north? Yeah, <laughs> just north of here. And his father is also a professor of Christian social ethics just across the bay at the San Francisco Theological Seminary. Um, so, so White, having immersed himself in the scriptures and studied them intently, um, he believed that the Christian scriptures had recessive genes that offered an alternative relationship between humanity and the rest of nature. I feel that before too long, he wrote, Christians will find themselves going on to the third legitimately <coughs> biblical position beyond dominion and stewardship, that, to the one where man is part of a spiritual democracy of all God's creatures. And it gets more interesting here. Organic and inorganic creatures, each praising his maker according to its law of being. So the spiritual democracy of all God's creatures is an idea that White repeats and emphasizes not just one or two or three times, but nearly a dozen publications on religion and ecology. He found support for this view not only through figures like St. Francis in the Christian tradition, but also in biblical texts like Psalm 96 and Daniel 3, 57 through 90. And recalling the book of Daniel, White pointed out that the biblical text makes, quote, no distinction between the categories of creatures, the angels, the heavenly bodies, winds and rain, ice and snow, fire and heat, night and day, seas and rivers, mountains and hills, whales and birds and beasts, men's and even souls of the dead. All of these creatures, he wrote, are urged to praise him, praise him and glorify him forever. White observed the attitudes towards nature, um, that this attitude towards nature understood humanity not as a manager of nature, as an exploiter of nature, as stewardship positions or dominion positions do, but rather as what he called a comrade of other creatures, all together in God's praise. And in his commentary on St. Francis of Assisi, 
a talk which he gave just a few miles away from here at the Bohemian Grove to celebrate the 800th anniversary of St. Francis' birth. White describes this unbounded community a bit further. He says, Francis was trying to set up <clears throat> a democracy of all God's creatures, and not simply living creatures, but also inorganic creatures, like rocks and mountains. He taught that we are all brothers and sisters. And in a similar vein, oops, sorry, I'm ending the quote there. In a similar vein, in a speech to the graduating class of the San Francisco Theological Seminary that was published in 1975 called Christians in Nature, White passionately described what it means to view oneself as part of this vast, inclusive community of creatures. He says, we are not alone. We humans are here in exactly the same sense and for the same purpose that sea urchins, banana trees, icebergs, quartz crystals, <coughs> asteroids, interstellar hydrogen clouds, and astronomical black holes are here. Our purpose and that of all our fellow creatures is, as the psalmist so often proclaims, to praise our creator with all our being. So within this spiritual democracy is a profound inclusivity. Humans, trees, rocks, natural processes, they're all participants. Uh, environmental historian Roger Fraser Nash comments on this aspect of White's thought. He observes that, quote, White's concept of a spiritual democracy stands out as, as one of the most radically inclusive ethical systems yet evolved. His sense of community literally knew no bounds. So by reading White with an eye towards this Christian animism, it's my intention to have shown that White was more than a mere critic of Christianity, that he's all often caricaturized as. His work was more constructive, more complex, and more theologically concerned with creatures than we usually give him credit for. While he does not think that, quote, many contemporary Americans who are concerned about our ecological crisis will either be able or willing to counsel with wolves or exhort birds, as St. Francis did, end quote, he does insist that any answer to the theological, to the theological <clears throat> that any theological answer to the environmental crisis needs to reconsider animal subjectivity, and that viewing all creatures as co-praisers is a viable, desirable ecotheological vision for the future. White maintained that ecotheology must, in short, be more creaturely, more democratic, and more open to the autonomy of all creatures, both living and non-living. If we are to stem the tide of the ecological crisis, we must be, as White asserts, uh, be more like St. Francis, who worshiped a God, who is both the God of squirrels and the God of men. Thank you. Thank you.